Hi everyone, here we go again. Uh, welcome for our seventh workshop this season. Time passed really fast. Today I'm here alone. <laughs> I do not have Claire or Anahita with me, but I'm gonna do my best to to hold uh, to, you know to help the speakers in this workshop. And for if you are new here, I'm Felipe Matias. I'm from North Dakota State University, and uh, Traditionally, in these workshop series, we always start with uh, one small presentation to introduce uh, what we are doing. So our group is called Phenomen Force. Uh, we started this project last year after one conference, and then we were missing uh, a, a channel or a place where uh, beginners could go and start learning phenomic and applying phenomic in their research, right? And this group, has a couple main ideas. Uh, for example, connecting people, making the network, making a community, uh, empower early career researchers, because uh, actually when we talk about early, early career, is more, I'm, I, I'm starting work with economics, what I do, right? Uh, that's the question that we wanna answer here. Also, we are providing these uh, online library for resources in economics and also free training, right? Because there are many, many, many tools over there and open source tools as well. Uh, and what we are trying to do is inviting these people for they show what they're doing in their labs and then sharing this with everyone, right? Uh, our, or, uh, there are a couple of people working with me in this project. I'm not alone. We have Anahita Mahano from University of Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> We have Claire from Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada, myself here from North Dakota State University, and Noah Falgren from Donadon Ford Plant Science Center. Here we go. So if you want to contact us, there are many possibilities. Uh, we do have our website, and we always upload information there. We also have the Twitter, and then uh, we always posting what we are doing, what our next a workshop or activity. We have the YouTube channel from where you guys are watching us right now. And also we have our Gmail account, our email. So please contact us in any one of these uh, social media. And uh, with the Gmail account, you also can uh, be part of, of our, not Gmail, but you can be part of our Slack channel. So if you're interested to be part of the Slack channel, just send an email to us and then we're gonna put you there. The Slack channel is a, this really nice uh, possibility to make our community communicate, <laughs> community communicate. And if you are new there, uh, we ask you to go here, introduction, and introduce yourself, where you're from, uh, which institution, what you are working, what you wanna learn with this community. So let us know uh, exactly what you're looking for and uh, we can try help you with these. We also have here this possibility called job offers. So if you have a new position in your office, uh, in your lab, on your team, you can also post, use this channel to post there and attract people on economics. And here, one of the most important, we love feedback, we love suggestions. If you wanna be part of this group, if you wanna present a workshop, if you wanna share uh, what you're doing in your lab, please let me know and uh, we can organize or set up a workshop for you too, okay? We do have our Phenomen Force YouTube channel. You guys is there right now, are there right now. We, de we do have many workshops already available uh, and uh, we need to up 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 update these. We are, right now our community has over 800 people, which is really great. So. Subscribe here if you didn't subscribe yet and share the videos with your friends, with your colleagues in your social media and help us to put this information out there, right? Uh, okay, last year we had one season in data analysis and this year our workshop series called Fried Hands On. Uh, it is setting up low cost phenotyping platforms. Uh, and when we talk about low cost phenotyping platforms, we are trying to find data online and build our own platforms. Uh, this workshop series started last April 9th. 
And we are on the seventh uh, series, uh, seventh workshop today. Uh, and again, here are people that were organizing this series. Uh, today, actually, uh, we have new uh, links. The links are here on the description of this video. So the speakers, they're going to uh, introduce themselves today. And also, they're going to explain how they can use how to use the information that is in the description to, uh, below this presentation, okay? Today we have this opportunity to have these two amazing researchers sharing with us. Uh, we have Max Fieldman uh, from USDA and also Arash from uh, Dakota State University. And they're gonna present a workshop called uh, Scalable Cost-Effective Phenotyping Solution to Facilitate Quantitative Genetic and Potatoes, right? And with these, I'm going to invite them and let them introduce themselves. Here we go. Hello, guys. Hi, Felipe. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Max Feldman. I'm a research geneticist with the USDA ARS stationed in Prosser, Washington. Uh, I'm a pre-breeder. I'm a potato pre-breeder. Uh, and uh, I'm really excited to be here today because uh, I'm passionate about this subject. We, we required... Uh, uh, development of low-cost phenotyping tools uh, to measure a lot of the characteristics of potatoes in our program. Hello, everybody. My name is Arash Abbasi, and I'm an assistant professor at Dakota State University. And I'm really happy that I'm here today, and uh, I'm going to talk about AI for plant phenotyping. Very awesome. Very awesome. <laughs> Do you want to share your screen? Yes. So uh, what, what's going to happen is I'm going to start off uh, and we're, it's going to be a, kind of a combination of uh, PowerPoint presentation and then like kind of like live coding demonstrations. So uh, I've never done this before. Uh, so bear with me. We'll see how this works. Uh, yeah, well, welcome. <laughs> hey, I, I'm looking forward to getting into it. Let's uh, I'm going to share my screen now and we'll uh, we'll give this a try and see how it goes. Okay? All right. Yeah, don't worry. Uh, and also, guys, uh, everybody know we are using internet, many devices. If someone here lost the connection, please stay there. We're going to do our best to come back in time. All right? So here we go, Max. Awesome. Thanks. Okay. Can, uh, can everybody see my screen now? Yes. We are seeing your full screen, actually. Wonderful. Right okay. Here. I will be right here. Let me know if you need anything, right? Awesome. Thank you so much. So here's kind of an outline of what we're going to talk about today. So first, I just want to kind of introduce the application. Like, why are we, uh, uh, why are we developing low-cost sensors or using uh, off-the-shelf hardware for our measurements? Um, we're going to go over uh, kind of how we use those uh, uh, consumer goods to perform data acquisition. We'll uh, discuss some uh, applications of analytical balances, uh, consumer grade cameras and a flatbed scanner. And then we'll do a short uh, OpenCV tutorial. Um, so we can acquire image data from uh, mapping populations. And we just want to demonstrate to folks how they can uh, extract the information from those images. And then we'll follow up with a little bit of uh, uh, data analysis. So now that we've extracted numbers from those images, uh, you know, what can we learn from this data? And then I will pass the uh, presentation over to uh, uh, Dr. Abbasi, and he could talk, uh, he'll talk a little bit about some of the methods that he's using in his group. So let's get into it, okay? Uh, so uh, welcome to the world of potato breeding. Um, as, a, as a scientist, most of my background has been in model organisms, so things like Arabidopsis and Ceteria viridis, but uh, I was hired as a uh, research geneticist focused on potato breeding about two years ago. And this is a lot different than uh, those model crops. So things that you need to think about uh, as far as this breeding system is that like potato is an obligate outcrossing tetraploid. So you like, it's not like corn or soybean. You can't fix beneficial alleles uh, within, it's a tetraploid. So it's just impossible to fix those alleles. The genome of potato contains many deleterious alleles, so you're not going to be able to get rid of those easily. Uh, so that's just something you're going to live with. Uh, 
Selection of material is largely based upon phenotype. So you're, you're planting out, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals and picking out ones that look good. And it's very difficult to increase, you know, so it's clonally propagated. So it's difficult to increase the amount of early material you have available. You're, you're doing your, uh, your evaluations in three hill, sometimes five hill, sometimes eight hill plots. So not a lot of sand, not a lot of material to work with. And as a commodity, uh, potato uh, has very demanding quality standards. There's a whole bunch of things that uh, need to be just perfect in order for the potato to be adopted by the processing industry uh, or fresh market consumers. Um, and, you know, for all these reasons above, that's why uh, potato is a clonally propagated crop. So my group uh, at USDA ARS Prosser is a pre-breeding program. So this is kind of an overview of what the uh, the tri-state breeding program, the breeding program that I'm a member of does. So uh, our role here is performing a lot of crosses, uh, uh, extracting seed from those, sending those off to our colleagues where we do uh, grow outs of mini tubers and then plant those for single hill selection out in Klamath Falls. So you're talking growing out somewhere between 60 to 100,000 single hills and walking through there and picking out the best ones. So selection at this stage is you know usually less than 1.5%. So you know you're looking through you're looking for the needle in the haystack. So all those uh, selections that are made at the single hill stage will then be increased and evaluated uh, in larger and larger plots and then in different locations over a period of 8 to 10 years. So making decisions, making better decisions early saves a huge amount of labor like downstream. So, I mean, despite all those challenges that I talked about in the uh, uh, the opening slide uh, we are making progress, uh, improving potatoes. So as a clonally propagated crop, like in, in the 1990s, 80% of potatoes that were grown, let's say in the United States or the Northwest, were uh, of this variety called Russet Burbank that uh, was developed about 100 years ago. But even though uh, the improvement of potato is not... Uh, uh, straightforward, easy. Uh, we are making progress because uh, touch point. It's not. We are making progress. We are getting uh, using this phenotypic selection. We are getting ver improved varieties to market, and they are taking market share away from us at Burbank. So this is not impossible. It's just slow, and uh, we think that if we can use more modern techniques to make better decisions, maybe it can accelerate the replacement of inferior varieties. So. As a pre-breeder, my role is to introgress dominant disease, disease resistant alleles. So we're looking at things like we want to in incorporate alleles, uh, like dominant resistance alleles that provide resistance to uh, like potato virus Y, tobacco rattle virus, uh, or Columbia root knot nematode, uh, or potato cyst nematodes. Um, for like, uh, these are all like, single locus dominant alleles. And for some of them like PVY, TRV and uh, cyst nematode, they've been mapped and they have markers. So, you know, we can apply uh, marker assisted selection to pick out individuals that have those alleles. But uh, when you go out and look at these things in the field, you got a lot of poor performers. So, you know, you're walking through these fields and you're looking at each potato for probably less than a minute and deciding like, oh, that looks like a good potato that doesn't look like a good potato. And you end up with a lot of uh, a lot of poor performers, which really decreases the efficiency of this. You know, like basically it's a numbers game. You know, you're trying to, you're trying to take the, uh, the best of all the bad stuff and then figuring out how well it performs downstream. You know, we want to make better, better decisions early. So my thought uh, has always been like, maybe quantitative genetics can help. You know, if we take, uh, if we make a cross between uh, uh, like a resistant and acceptable variety and then measure the phenotype, uh, this is the laborious part, right? That's why we're here. That's why we're talking about this. Uh, we can genotype those populations easy enough. And then using like linkage mapping or association mapping, we can identify QTL and markers to perform selection. So, uh, well, yeah. So what, what we like to do is uh, use those markers. So from these crosses, get true potato seed and then generate, uh, you know, submit all like tissue samples from all these individuals for genotyping and be able to pick out the best individuals, things that have the disease resistance, things that yield well, and that have ideal tuber characteristics. Uh, we think that that, I think that that will increase our success overall and increase the efficiency of my breeding program. 
So uh, the breeding pro- I took over this breeding program three years ago, and I was astounded at how little information there are about the material I'm crossing. And one of the things that I've really pushed hard for over the last two years is I need to improve the capacity uh, to document like the characteristics of the breeding clones that we use that are uh, that we commonly use. Uh, we have really uh, limited uh, information about these things. So if you look at like the data sheets from our program, it might tell you like the type of potato. So it's a russet, it's a, a chipper, or it's a fingerling. And it might tell you like, that's a really nice red red, or that looks like Terra Rosa. But you know, like I'm not an expert in this. I, uh, I've never seen Terra Rosa. I don't know what Terra Rosa looks like, you know? So if I, I need like quantitative descriptors so I can compare and make better decisions about the crosses that I make you know? Um, and because this process is so labor intensive, I mean, think about it. You're, you're putting it, you're setting up all these plants, you're making crosses, you're extracting seed, you're growing up mini tubers, you're planting them out to trial them, then you're making selections. Uh, if you can improve this process and the efficiency of this process in any, any way, that saves labor and time and uh, it just makes our lives easier. So in order to, in order to do this, we've adopted a uh, you know, several uh, measurement strategies. Basically, I want to be able to measure the characteristics uh, of uh, uh, all, you know, uh, the full, the characteristics of every plant that goes out in the field. Uh, we can do that uh, using uh, drone imaging, which I'm not going to talk a lot about this today, and tuber characteristics. So things like, like, you know, how many tubers came out of the ground? What's the specific gravity of the tubers? You know, what are the characteristics of the tubers? And this is the... Uh, this is what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So when you're thinking about deploying a measurement strategy, um, one of the things that I really hadn't appreciated is that, uh, I mean, this is new. People that are working in your breeding program, if you're new and you're trying to deploy these methods in a breeding program that's existed for, let's say uh, 30 years, 40 years, a lot of the people in the breeding program may not see value for adding these measurements. I mean you've been performing phenotypic selection by just going out in the field and picking like, this looks like a nice tuber. Uh, and you know what a nice tuber looks like, you know, you're not going to see any value of measuring hundreds of tubers and that's okay. Uh, they, these people. So the folks in my group, these are uh, two technicians that work within our program. They don't work directly for me, but they work within our program. They can provide you with a lot of, uh, they're, they're important. They can provide you with a lot of guidance and feedback regarding what they, for, what they see, as being important, but the people who are gonna be taking the measurements, at least in our group, have been uh, uh, time slip workers. So we have uh, two workers here, uh, Caitlin Green and Moises Ponce, who are time slip workers who uh, came to us from uh, local high schools and local community colleges. Um, So they're the ones, the the measurement strategies that you put into place have to be uh, simple enough for Caitlin and Moises to be able to take all the measurements and then for Rich and Lana to be able to supervise them taking those measurements, if that makes any sense. So uh, let's start off just talking about uh, tuber characteristics. So we'll start with gravimetric measurements. So things things that you can measure with a scale, right? Uh, Things like yield, like how many tubers came out of the ground, how much does it weigh, and then specific gravity. So we'll... uh, so let's talk about data acquisition with uh, analytical balances. Uh, here's the equation for specific gravity. Basically what you need to be able to do uh, for yield and for specific gravity is you need to be able to take a measurement of the tuber in air and then a measurement of the tuber in water. Um, why this is important for potatoes is processing potatoes generally need to have a high specific gravity, so high starch content, whereas like fresh market potatoes tend to have a higher moisture content, so lower specific gravity you know, because you're mashing those things or uh, microwaving them or whatever. So uh, we, we've taken some of these old specific gravity machines that are, are present, uh, you know, around the campus that I work on, and we've retrofitted them to fit in uh, scales that can be programmed uh, using a computer. So the choice of scale that we made was this O-House Valor 7000 uh, and this particular model number. We picked this one because it's really good for measuring yield and specific gravity of small plots. So think like between three and three and eight hill plots, its maximum capacity is about 15 kilograms. So just to give you an idea uh, of you know how much tubers that is, we uh, for our trials last year, I think the largest volume of tubers that came out of a five hill plot was like eight kilograms. 
So, you know, we have some room to increase that, uh, but it's fairly accurate, even, even at low, low volumes of tubers, so less than a kilogram, just because the readability is, uh, you know, such a small percentage. Um, other things that we thought about is like, it's got to be able to take measurements uh, from the bottom of the scale with the way that uh, uh, this device is set up. So it has like an underhook option. And what really made this important, what really made this the right scale for us is that we can connect it to a Raspberry Pi uh, computer via USB. They have a, they sell a USB kit that will just plug right into the USB. Uh, taking these measurements, uh, uh, it, we'll, we'll get into how to how we take those measurements. So things that you need to think about if you're taking specific gravity measurements are basically you want to clean and dry the samples before you start. Um, we did that by hand last year. That was terrible. We think that probably uh, a barrel washer would be a better way to go. Uh, you want to uh, ensure that both the water temperature and the pulp is about 50 degrees. So we have like a controlled environment room outside of our, our cold storage that's pretty good for that. You want to know the another key factor is you want to know like how much the basket that you put uh, the potatoes in weigh uh, outside of the water and inside of the water because you're going to use that later to subtract off uh, those from the weight that you acquire using the scale. And you know even though this is not realistic for uh, for our breeding program because we have a lot of a lot of samples that are small, it's desirable to have the the, the weight of each sample between seven four to seven kilograms. So. Here's where we're going to get into uh, a little bit of the, the demonstration portion. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, switch over to the GitHub page, and we're just going to look at what's in this script. So basically what happens is the user will go, they'll launch this program here, uh, Raspberry Pi, OHS Gravity Collector. And there's two arguments. Basically, what do you want to save the file as and then who the user is? Like, So who's taking the measurements? This program relies heavily upon the, uh, the Python serial library for communication with the hardware. And the output is a uh, CSV file containing uh, the sample name, dry weight, wet weight, the date, time, and the user. So that kind of tells you like when the sample was taken, who took the sample, and it'll give you a way to like track back, like uh, you know uh, how long did it take per sample? Is uh, one worker taking samples a lot faster than another worker? Is one worker getting all kinds of weird values that you might need to adjust for? Uh, those are just things to think about when you're acquiring data like this. So. Let's switch over. Let's let's go look at the program itself. Okay, um, go to uh, the GitHub page, and we'll check out what's inside. What's under the hood of this uh, Oh House Scale Gravity Collector? So I don't know about you. Um, I don't know if I don't know if this is intentional or not, but uh, or this is just something I learned over time. But I tend to. Uh, uh, define the, the libraries that I'm going to use up at the top of the program. So these are some libraries that uh, that we need in order to run the program. Serial is important. So here what you're doing is you're setting up a, a serial port between uh, the Raspberry Pi and the uh, the scale itself. A lot of uh, a lot of this information here uh, you get right out of the manual in the, the OHAS scale. So the, the baud rates, so a rate of communication, the byte size, how many bits are sent to stop uh, stop transmission uh, and the port you're using, which is a uh, standard port on the Raspberry Pi. Uh, you know, so things that are important here. Box? Yes. Uh, can you increase uh, the ladder a bit? Uh, Let me try that. Least. Is that is that better? Yeah, way better. Way okay. better. And another thing, could, could you press hide on this small box? No. Uh, hide. Yes. Ah, here. thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I was wondering if it was uh, my computer is yours, but I just saw that. Okay. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah I can see this pretty clear, but I hadn't really uh, thought about uh, the folks online. So uh, thanks for pointing that out. Um, oh yeah, that, yeah, my job. <laughs> so yeah, like I like to, uh, you know, you import your libraries on top, uh, set up your serial port, and then then what I do is I usually define my functions. So these functions will be the same for a lot of the. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the programs that we're going to talk about today, the first one's just like a recursive yes, no. So oftentimes, you know, when the user is going through uh, entering information, you'll want to double check to make sure that they entered the right information, you know, so it, it requires a lot of yes, no. So basically, this recursive function is just asking, you know, you, you give it a question like, uh, uh, is the sample name correct? And you have them, you know, type Y or no for an enter or for an answer. Uh, and 
if it's yes, you just return yes. And you know, it's a, a true or false and that's great. You move on to the next step or no, and then it will go and enter another loop where it fixes the problem. Uh, and then, you know, if, uh, if it doesn't understand what you entered, it'll just reloop back and do it again. So you have other, other functions where, you know, you can change the argument. So if the argument wasn't entered correctly, you can change it. Uh, you know, you can, uh, so yeah, uh, change the argument, change the sample. But here's really like kind of the meat of what happens in this program. So here what you're doing, this is, this is, this is a, one of the most important functions here. We are saying, okay, we want to get the weight of the sample. What's going to happen is, is that uh, you, uh, you're going to make a call to the, uh, uh, to the hardware saying, okay, I want to read information uh, from the scale. So the, the user will, uh, you know, uh, it says, okay, hit enter, and then it will say, and then you want to push the button on the scale. It will read the information delivered from the scale. It will decode it from bytes into a text format. Uh, from UTF-8 format, and then use like a regular expression to extract uh, the numerical value from the scale. Uh, so it'll remove all the text, and then what you'll do is uh, it will uh, print out, you know, like this is the weight we recorded. Do you want to do it again, yes or no? So if the weight looks wonky or, uh, you know, if you're happy with it, you can push yes. If not, you can take the, the weight again. Uh, and then here's another function that just... Uh, uh, you know, it, it takes the dry weight and the wet weight. So, uh, you know, here's what here's what the uh, the program will look like when you're running it. Um, you know, what you're going to do is you're going to, uh, uh, you know, it's going to ask you, you know, so, okay, uh, does it look right? Did you enter the information correctly? Uh, is there anything you'd like to change? Um, is the date and time correct? It'll take the date and time. And then it will uh, set up a, a summary table to input the data in. And then you know, it'll ask you, do you want to exit? No, because you're taking your first sample. And it will just keep looping through. So uh, yeah, it will, uh, it'll take the sample. You, you, we use a barcode scanner to read it off. That eliminates errors. Uh, but you could also enter it in through text. One of the things that I hadn't realized is that basically a barcode reader is just providing text input. So this is really easy to implement into your workflow. Uh, and yeah, it will take your, your sample weight, uh, it'll, it'll record the date, time, and then print that out to a file and just keep looping through that again and again and again until you hit exit. So uh, that's kind of what we've done to, uh, to take those uh, gravity measurements. So now that we've covered that, let's move on to uh, computer vision measurements. So uh, potatoes, uh, even though it's pretty simple, you know, it, the idea of this is pretty simple. Measuring these things on a large scale is difficult. So the things that we need to measure are like, how large is the tuber that we get from this clone? How many tubers do we get? Uh, the, uh, the shape of the tuber is important depending upon what type or what the application uh, of this tuber is. So if you want like a russet potato for French fries, you want it to be long and kind of, uh, you want it to be more rectangular, like, like a brick. Whereas like chipping potatoes, which are for potato chips, uh, you want it to look like a baseball. And then you have like specialties, which are fresh markets. So things like fingerlings or baby potatoes, those can look like anything, you know, uh, especially some of the really like uh, unusual potatoes that people like to eat at high end restaurants. They can look really weird. Um, as far as you want to measure things like skin quality or flesh quality. So things for like, processing like chips or russets, you want to have lack of color. So you want to be very uniform, whereas for the fresh market, like color is desirable. You know, you want things to be pigmented and look kind of cool. Other things that you might want to address are like sprouting, uh, skinning, or like eye depth. Um, and computer vision is a really efficient way to collect these measurements uh, because, you know, you just put the uh, uh, the tuber under a sensor and it'll, it'll uh, collect a lot of those measurements simultaneously. Requirements are is, you know, for we need to be able to collect information on between five and hundred tubers for, you know, hundreds of clones. So lots of, lots of small samples. Um, and for this particular application, we used equipment that we already, that USDA ARS already owned at my station, making like, you know, this trial pretty inexpensive and that, you know, this data can be collected by student employees. So what we did is, you know, we have a, uh, an imaging box with a camera and then we have a flatbed scanner. Initially we thought, well, We'll put the tubers on the flatbed scanner, but th that really doesn't work too well. Um, but if uh, you cut the tubers in half, you can get pretty nice images of the internals of the tubers. So 
that's what we did. Uh, the study that I'm going to be talking about today is a collaborative project with my colleagues at uh, USDA ARS in Aberdeen, uh, particularly Jay Park. Um, so we're studying this mapping population. This consists of about uh, 190, 190 clones replicated twice, and then each each uh, replicate is about five tubers. So you're talking at about 2,000 tubers. Um, the cool thing is if we can take all these measurements, uh, you know, all, all the measurements of those things, Jay uh, can use uh, quantitative genetics. He's, he's genotyped this population. He can use quantitative genetics to, to map and select on these traits. So uh, this is just a little bit of information about our, uh, our digital imaging platform. We're gonna go over it like, real, like a, a real high level and then we'll go in a little bit more closely. So the images acquired are acquired using this uh, Nikon uh, D7100 DSLR camera. Basically it's inside this imaging box, a Havix uh, imaging box. And because we weren't sure necessarily what was better to do it on a, uh, a non-reflective back, black background or a, uh, an illuminator box, uh, we did it on both. Um, and then we control the camera using a Python script, which is run on a Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, to determine like the, uh, the imaging settings, we used uh, you know, the, uh, the autofocus detection algorithms on the camera. Um, so let, let's think a little bit more about how to set that up. So for this camera, uh, basically the important things that you need to know are, uh, this is a good one because it's very high resolution, meaning that you can uh, be pretty far away from the object and get really detailed images, really high resolution images of the, the subject. And it's also compatible with the G G2 photo library, which is the way what we use to set the, uh, to set the imaging parameters on the camera so they're identical for each image. What's important for this is, is you need to set all the, uh, uh, the manual exposure and focus things to, to manual. So you'll need to have it set for manual here, switch it over to manual, switch it over to manual. Um, just so the computer can control the camera, the camera's not doing any work because you don't want to have any change between the images that you're acquiring. So parameters that we set using the G2 photo library are white balance, ISO, shutter speed, and f-stop. Um, I'm not gonna talk a lot about what these mean because we have definitions here, but for the white balance, uh, we set that so it would be as close as possible to the, uh, uh, the light temperature of the, the LED lights within the imaging box. So the imaging booth we used is this photo studio. This is really nice. I mean, it, uh, it provides a very consistent lighting uh, and it's easy to set up and take down, um, which, you know, if you need to move it, that's nice. One of the things that's important to do is think about uh, how far these two lights are apart. You don't want them right next to each other. You don't want them far apart. Um, so we used a, uh, a ruler just to measure, you know, to make sure that they're spaced equidistantly. Uh, initially, we started off using a tripod uh, with a, uh, a water jug as a counterbalance. That worked okay, but you still get a lot of movement on this. Uh, later, we built a, a scaffold out of uh, 2,4-D aluminum. I wouldn't recommend this. I actually would recommend using PVC pipe because it's cheaper and easier to work with, but I mean, this works too. So uh, let's look a little bit at the, uh, the data acquisition routine using the digital camera. So uh, basically it's pretty similar to the way we take uh, the scale measurement. We launch this program, same arguments, but this program relies upon systems calls. So this is not called in Python. Python makes a system call to the GPhoto 2 library to acquire the images. And the output is a JPEG image and basically a CSV file containing the metadata. So let's go look at what that looks like. So let's see, we wanna go back to hardware control. Repos. Okay, here we are. Here we are. Okay, so uh, this is, it's very similar to the last program, as I said, uh, you know, we're defining our uh, our libraries up front. Um, we start off just by making sure that uh, all the G2 photo processes are killed. Um, and then, you know, we're defining our functions, you know, our, uh, our recursive yes, no, uh, how to change the arguments, 
uh, get the samples. But here's the first uh, the first uh, image capture uh, you know function that we use. And basically, what we're doing is yes, we're making a, a sub process call. So we're making a system call to GPhoto two, and basically we're setting the configs for you know ISO, white balance, f stop, and shutter speed. Um, and then what we do down here is we uh, we capture the image using uh, this uh, systems call down here. Um, so what this will do is it will it will you know send the set for each image it will send the settings to the camera and then uh, capture the image and then write that to your Raspberry Pi computer. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about that, it, it, this is very similar to the last program. Um, so if you have any questions about that, uh, I'm happy to. Uh, to answer those in greater detail. Uh, okay. So uh, here's what we did for our uh, for our experiment. So for each for each sample we had, so we took an image of both tuber sides. So uh, side one, side two on the black background, and side one, side two on the light box, using different camera settings that were automatically applied through the. Uh, uh, GPhoto 2 library. So this is an example just of what the workflow looks like for the computer vision. So you know you have your original image, you crop it, and then you uh, extract uh, out different color channels and perform thresholding to get the images. Um, but what I'd really like, I mean, this is useful, but what I'd really like to do is take us through an example. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to launch a Jupyter Notebook. So what let's, uh, if you're working along at home, I would say download this tutorial from the GitHub uh download it and then put it on your computer and then uh unzip it and we'll run the tutorial so the first one the first tutorial is right here So the first step is uh, there's a lot of information here. So if you're following along at home, you know, uh, feel free to read through it. Uh, there's a, uh, you know, the first step is just you know import our libraries, right? So these are all the libraries we need to uh, to run this script, and then uh, basically we want to set uh, you know set our working directory. So our working directory is uh, the present working directory because we moved into that directory before we launched the Jupyter session, and we're going to read in an example photo. Uh, from the directory black background, and uh, basically we're going to uh, we're going to we're going to search within uh, this directory for anything that has uh, this texturing. So we're looking for JPEG images in this folder, and we from this and get a list of the files there. So we're going to use the first file and we're going to work on that. Okay. So basically, here we are. We're going to print the image name, and we're going to split it off into uh, its components. Here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to read the image uh, using uh, the uh, OpenCV2 and then plot it and just see what it looks like. Oh, that's weird, huh? Like, uh, when you look at these, uh, potatoes are, uh, are brown, not blue. What could be going on here, huh? Well, it turns out that if you're uh, if the format that the images output from your camera is different than uh, the format for uh, OpenCV, you end up with a switch between the R and the the uh, the B channel. So you can use this function uh, convert color uh, to convert it into a, uh, a more into the color the appropriate color space. That's what we're doing here at this step. Okay, that looks better, doesn't it? Um, so the dimensions of the image are 4,000 rows by 6,000. It's a three color image, so there's three channels, red, blue, and blue. Then we're gonna uh, crop the image. So we're, we're just, what we're wanting to do here is we want to eliminate things that will reflect and be picked up by our, uh, we want to isolate the tubers and it, it'll be harder to isolate them using this manual thresholding if there are things that are reflective in the background. So we just want to get stuff, we want to focus in on the tubers we're selecting. Now we're going to uh, add in some salt and pepper noise to uh, obscure small features, and then convert uh, this image into uh, several different color spaces that we can use for thresholding, like we showed in the uh, uh, in the tutorial in the in the uh, PowerPoint document. Max, 
Yes. Could you, could you try increase the ladder? How's that? Is that better? Yeah, that's better. I, I keep forgetting about that. <laughs> I, I, it's uh, okay. It's okay. Thank, yeah, uh, yeah I, you got to keep reminding me. I uh, I appreciate that. So, yeah. So as, as we mentioned in the PowerPoint document, you know, you're going to uh, you're looking for uh, you're looking for channels or uh, that show good contrast of the tuber between the uh, you know the uh, the foreground and the background. So here's just an example of the HS uh, HSV, uh, the image transformed to HSV color scale. And here's a, a saturation channel. So, you know, you get reasonable uh, discrimination between the foreground and the background, particularly for the, the size marker we have here. So we'll look at uh, what they look like in several different channels. So yeah, th this shows pretty good contrast. You can probably uh, isolate the tuber from the background here. Whereas for the H channel, hue, you're not gonna be able to do that at all. That's really gonna be a lot harder. Um, what we did is, you know, we look at, uh, uh, a histogram of the values from these images. And uh, so this is for the saturation channel here. You can clearly see there's another peak here. So probably everything like uh, to the left, or I mean to the right of potato, uh, right of 100 is probably potato, whereas everything to the left is probably the background. So if you use the thresholding, uh, you can isolate the tuber fairly well. So here we're uh, here's the result of uh, combining both the binaries. So we've done thresholding on two channels. Uh, I believe it was the uh, the B from like LAB and the uh, the saturation channel from HSV. Combine them, and we do a pretty good job of isolating the tubers. And we can also do a good job of isolating the poker chip which is the size marker. The next thing we'll do is we'll want to remove a lot of the, the background noise uh, using like a kernel and erode and dilate function. So erode will remove small pixels, whereas dilate will like kind of inflate it back. So that's what this step will, will look like. So that's, that's the, uh, the kernel that we're using for the erosion and dilation. Um, and these are the output images. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to find like the contours of the image, you know? So what are the, uh, the shapes of the potatoes. We want to get like an outline of, the, you know, what are the contours, the, the, the tubers themselves. Okay, let's see. I think that's working, let's see. Okay, here we go. So there's a lot of contours here, 105, you know, so we're drawing them all in green here. How many contours to the marker? There's one for the marker. So we're drawing all the, uh, the contours and the one in yellow. And next we want to remove all the contours that are not potato. And we'll do that using a loop in Python. So I don't know if you're not familiar with writing loops, this is a really introduction tutorial. So here's just an example of uh, a loop. So here we have a list of potatoes, which is similar to uh, contours. And we're just gonna loop through, you know, for each one, print what it is. And then if it matches that, we say that, you know, that's what it is. So this is just an example of a loop in Python for somebody who's not used to that. You can kind of learn uh, how to make a loop there. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to sort the contours by size. So the, the, the tubers are the biggest contours and then keep uh, only the largest six. Okay, so now we have uh, the five largest contours. And for this experiment, uh, the tubers are in order. So if you look back at the, uh, the original image here, um, you'll notice the tubers are numbered like six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. That's because we've taken manual measurements of the tubers as well. And we want to be able to track that back. So uh, what we did here, what we're doing here at this step is we just want to, uh, where are we? Okay, what we're doing at this step is we're, we're trying to uh, we're trying to figure out we're trying to assign the right tuber to the right number. Okay, so we have um, so here here we're just converting the uh, the, the coordinates so uh, the contour and then the centroid along the x uh, the x axis and the centroid along the y axis and we're going to sort those values you know by uh, by their x value. So let's see what this looks like. 
gets running. Okay, here we are. So uh, as you can see, you know, you're, uh, if you, you can clearly uh, get the, uh, the tubers on the right side from the ones on the left side based upon their, uh, their coordinates within the image. So uh, here you're, you're getting everything that is, uh, you know, on the right side and then along the y-axis, you know, so this would be tuber six, tuber seven, tuber eight. Uh, and here on this side, you have uh, tuber nine, tuber 10. Um, so you're, you're able to uh, uh, pick out which tubers are which and assign those based upon the order uh, of those contours. So now we'll plot the contours. We're basically just showing that, you know, A, we can, uh, th these are individual uh, tubers. You know, we can do this uh, uh, two different ways. You know, there's a, another way to do this up here. So we, we don't have time to go through all the details of, uh, of how you can do this. And, but, you know, the code's there and we can go through that. Uh, you can contact me, we can go through that in more detail. Um, so let's close out this particular session just by uh, writing the images to a file uh, using uh, uh, this function here. And one thing I'd like you to think about is, could you do this again using a different image? Uh, that's, that, so that's the end of uh, this first tutorial. Um, so now we'll move on to uh, get more information about uh, uh, how to measure things like, uh, so the things that we wanna measure from these images, now that, now that we know we can get, we can isolate uh, the individual tubers uh, we want to know how to take measurements from there. So measurements we're interested in taking are things like area. So, you know, what's the area of the tuber, how long they are, how wide they are. Uh, we'd also like to uh, measure different characteristics of tuber shape. So uh, I first became aware of kind of these like latent trait methods uh, in one of these phenom force presentations uh, done by Mitchell Feldman last year. Uh, and he referenced this paper called, uh, this paper by, uh, uh, Dr. Turner, um, where they use something called a biomass profile. Basically, you're taking the binary of the tuber and you're basically calculating, you know, across uh, the axis, how many pixels are uh, our tuber, you know? So, uh, you know, towards the top, you're gonna have uh, fewer pixels or a fewer proportion of pixels that are tuber, whereas in the center, you're gonna have more that are tuber. Uh, so you can do that across uh, both axes, both the X and the Y axes, but I think it's inappropriate maybe to do it across the Y axis. After talking to uh, one of the, the more senior authors on this paper, uh, Nathan Miller. So uh, co let's come back to that uh, later, but we'll show how to do this type of analysis here in the next step. And other things we'd like to extract are measurements of tuber color. So, you know, we can threshold the tuber from the background, we can break it out into its three color channels, and then color is represented kind of as a histogram. Uh, uh, of each channel. So the proportion of pixels from each channel, the, uh, the blue, green, and red, the proportion of pixels that fall into each one of these values from zero to 255. So uh, let's go through a uh, measurement of this uh, in one of these Jupyter notebooks. So, okay. These first two steps are going to be very similar to the last, the last tutorial we ran, where we're just going to uh, import the libraries. And then don't get too hung up about what, what's going on here, because this is exactly what we did in the last tutorial, OK? Uh, it's just you know all put in the same cells. We have the data to work with, OK? OK, so now we're just going to do like kind of a sanity check to make sure that everything looks good. Yeah, looks good. We have the order of the contours. This is the image name. And yeah, that's the image we're working with. So now we're just going to uh, look at some of the values. So we're going to assign some variables that will be used later. So we, we want like to set up like a, a data storage area to store the data we're going to extract from the tubers. So, you know, uh, what's the metadata that's in the image name? You know, we're going to set up uh, uh, column names for tables that contain the values of the histogram from the red, green, and blue channels, or from the latent traits, from the, 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 the sweeps along the X and the Y axis. And then we're gonna make a summary table that kind of contains all of that information. Um, 
and then you know prepare tables that empty tables that where that information will go. Okay. So uh, like I said earlier, each tuber was uh, was weighed and measured uh, using digital calendar, cal calipers at Aberdeen. So we need to be able to track you know which tuber is which. So here we're just going to assign uh, you know what tuber number is what, and then uh, associate it with the uh, uh, the uh, uh, contour order. And here, at this step, we're going to uh, take the measurements and then extract the values from them. Uh, this this area, this this function right here, or this this set of code right here, is largely based upon uh, a plant CV function uh, named analyze object. So, you know. Uh, Basically, we extract, you know, we took all the information out there and we're using that in, in our tutorial here to kind of extract those numbers from the image. So here's what the masked potato looks like. You know, so we're getting our potato from the background. And then, you know, we can measure things like length and width, uh, area, centroid right there. And here's, and that, so, you know, we have, we here we're, eight, we're collecting all that information. Uh, we're up here, actually. We're collecting all that information. And we're plotting it here. And now we want to calculate some of those latent traits we were talking about earlier. So basically what we're going to do is, you see how this tuber is laying sideways? What we want to do is we want to rotate it so it's like vertical, you know? So it's rotated to be, uh, its longest axis is uh, uh, vertical. So we're going to uh, fit an ellipse and figure out how many how many degrees we need to rotate it. We're gonna rotate the image, and then we're gonna get the contours uh, of this, uh, of this uh, image, crop it to the, uh, uh, the bounding rectangle, um, rotate it again, convert it to grayscale, and then one of the, one of the requirements of this uh, is that the uh, the dimensions of the image need to be identical? So we want it to be a hundred by hundred. So basically, you're going to fit you're going to fit a box around the uh, around the tuber itself, like a rectangle around the tuber, and you're going to use the uh, the length along the the y-axis, so how long the tuber is, and you're going to uh, pad the along the x-axis, so how wide the tuber is. You're going to add zeros until it is a uh, a uniform size. So if the, the dimensions of the along the y-axis, if the length of the tuber is, uh, let's say, uh, 1900, you want the width to be 1900. So, you, you know, if, if the, the width of it is uh, 1000, you're going to have to add uh, 450 uh, zeros on both sides. So that's what we're doing here. We're adding pads. We're resizing it to a, uh, a size of 100 by 100 pixels, uh, calculating the sweeps across uh, both axes, and then uh, calculating as a proportion, and then you know writing those to uh, tables to output. So we'll we'll run this, and see what we get here. Okay, we've already done that. Oh no, we haven't done that yet. So here, yeah. So we, we here we 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 need to rotate it about ninety degrees. Here's what it looks like now. We're going to crop the tuber uh, to fit a bounding rectangle. And then we're going to pad it on both sides so that so it's a it's a perfect square and rescale it to hundred. Now we're going to want to extract like the color channels. So uh, basically, you can split the image into its three different channels, and then uh, we're going to plot what each each of them looks like, and then we're going to calculate a histogram of each of these uh, uh, tubers or each of these channels using a mask for the tuber. Uh, set it so it's the proportion of pixels, and then uh, plot the histogram of those values. So, oh, huh. maybe I missed a step up here. Well, it, I don't think that will matter for the downstream. Let me see. Okay, we have our masked tuber up here. Mask tuber or mask spot? Yeah, that that's always happened with me too. <laughs> <laughs> it is uh, a little bit embarrassing, but 
I no, mean, no, don't worry. Yeah, so I mean, it's working now. I think you know we're gonna get them from all the right ones, and you know we'll get our histogram of the the tumor. Yeah, so. yeah and then you know we, uh, you know, you're gonna populate the uh, the values into uh, rows and tables, and you know here's just an example of what the row looks like. So you know for each each value along the 250 values it could be in the uh, along the R channel, you know it's gonna have uh, the proportion of pixels that fell into that channel. So it's one row by 256 columns. Now we'll uh, concatenate all the data together and uh, into a summary table. So basically we're, uh, we're putting all the data together into a summary table and then we'll just write it out to uh, write it out to a file. So oh my God. So uh, I mean, I'm not sure if that uh, went as smoothly as I wanted, but you, if you follow along with this uh, at home, uh, I'm sure that you'll get the uh, I'm sure it'll work smoother than it is live for me right now. But I hope you got an idea of you know how you can extract data from these images that you acquired using the uh, the RGB sensor. So uh, we'll leave this section now. Um, and now what we're going to do is we're going to work on kind of uh, analyzing the information that came out of that uh, of those pipelines. Okay, so let's see. Where are we? Show. Okay, so we also did like scanner-based imaging. Um, for, for this experiment, we used a... Uh, uh, an HP ColorJet 1600. This worked really well. You could just plug this directly into your Raspberry Pi and make systems calls to uh, uh, using the Python Sane library to get that thing to run. Um, we also recently tried uh, using a Canon uh, LiD 300 scanner. This solution doesn't work. Uh, we tried, you know, we can get it to work, um, particularly following the, uh, the instructions here, but uh, and you know you need to power because this uh, this scanner requires more power. Uh, you need to have a, a a powered USB in order to. So you basically have this USB hub. You plug in the scanner. You plug that into a uh, uh, a wall outlet, and then you plug the other USB into the Raspberry Pi. You can make it work using systems calls, but it's really unstable. Like uh, you have to reformat the Raspberry Pi SD card. I've had to reformat it many times, so I would not recommend this. What I would recommend is looking at this thread. Uh, and then uh, maybe using uh, a different operating system rather than Raspberry Pi to operate these LiD, these Canon LiD scanners. Uh, we have a, uh, uh, a program that runs, that tells you how to run the scanner on GitHub. You can check it out if you want, um, but we're not gonna go into it right now in this tutorial. So now, you know, now we wanna really uh, uh, analyze the, the, the data that we collected, you know, using that from that, uh, that Jupyter Notebook tutorial. So you can download uh, the data file right here. And there's a couple questions we wanna answer um, from this data. So the first thing we'd like to know is like, you know, of these three ways we measured tubers, you know, the, the black background, the flatbed scanner, and the illumination box, like, you know, which one was the most consistent? You know, so we could do that by measuring a size standard. So here we have a poker chip that is, uh, in, e in each image, we include a, uh, a poker chip for size and a color checker card for measuring the consistency of the color values. And the first step is we just want to know, you know, what one's most consistent. So here we're going to uh, we're going to load up uh, the data uh, that came from this download right here, this, this GitHub repo. Uh, this contains all the data you'll need, but you'll, you'll download this as a zip file, you'll unzip it. And then in this file, uh, this, is, this is the analysis, this is the R script we're gonna be following along with, but you're gonna need to unzip this. This is a zipped, this is such a large file, you know, it's about 30 megs, you'll need to unzip it. Um, and then we'll work from there. So here, now we, uh, we have our, uh, our file here. Um, once again, we import the libraries we're going to use. Uh, we define some functions. So, like, uh, you know, heritability, broad sense heritability is something we're going to measure. So we have a function that will, merit, that will measure broad sense heritability. And then we're just going to load in the data. I'll, I'll, 
don't worry, Felipe. I, uh, I'm going to increase the size of this. Uh, there we go. I hope that I hope that people can see this at home. You, you read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I hope people can see this at home. It's not really uh, easy to see, but uh, basically no, what we're doing. Is great. Yeah. Basically, what we're doing is we're or, you know we're going to set the directory. This will be different on your computer. Um, basically, this is just on our desktop. It's the the folder we downloaded. You're going to set the directory, and then you're going to load in the data uh, from the uh, the black background, uh, from the uh, the light box, the illumination box. You're going to combine those together, and then you know the the measurements from the scanner. So you know that that's a, and you know you're going to make some you're going to make some directories or some file paths to write out your uh, your figures to and stuff like that. Okay, so like I said, the first thing we want to do is we want to uh, use the size standard. We want to uh, know like how variable uh, the size standard is on each of these platforms. We want to be as as least. I mean, this thing doesn't change at all, you know, between each image. So we want to know what imaging platform gives us the uh, uh, the most consistent measurements of uh, of uh, uh, standard size. So in so in this. Uh, Let's just look at the uh, both. So this this both uh, data frame right here. This is just the black background and the illumination box uh, kind of combined together, stacked on top of each other. And let's just look at what that looks like. You know, one through. Let's look at rows one through three. Maybe columns one through fifteen, maybe. So yeah, your uh, you know, you have your, your image name, your clone, your replicate, what side of the tuber, what, what lighting or, you know, what background is there, the tuber, the tuber number. So which tuber number it was. And we also have this thing called marker. That's, that's the, the size standard. And then, you know, it's coordinates, area, perimeter. You know, you could extend that out to uh, 25. You know, you're starting to get the color channels. And then at the end, you have your shape char characteristics there as well. Uh, so yeah, we're going to extract basically the marker from both the top down, uh, the top down imaging. So that would be both the, uh, the illumination and the black background, and from the scanner. You know, we'll remove all the columns that we're not interested in, um, and then do some reformatting. Then we're going to want to uh, calculate. You know, what's the uh, the length and width uh, of the uh, of the measurements we take based upon the size standard. So the poker chip is 37 millimeters in diameter. And we'll convert it to uh, long form for plotting, you know, using ggplot. So we'll make a, basically a plot of all the different quantities that we, you know, we measured here. Let's see if it should plot that out. You. Maybe, maybe it just did. Okay, so we'll, we'll go down and look at some of the figures we made that I think will be uh, more illustrative. So you know, for area. So so how very how variable is the area of this poker chip uh, on the black background, uh, the flatbed scanner, and the illumination box based upon pixel size? They're pretty similar, right? Like uh, you might say that this is a little bit more variable. Um, but it's tough to say with the way that is plotted. Let's look at another uh, another component of this. So here's just the distance. So the estimation of distance. Uh, so this would be like the width of the, the poker chip. So you find that uh, the flatbed scanner tends to have uh, a less variance, slightly less variance than the black background, but the illumination box is all over the all over the map. Um, and another way you could plot this, another way you could look at this data is, you know, the proportion of error that you get, you know, um, maybe like the, uh, you know, for the measurement, how variable it is, you know, what's the difference from the average, the percent area? Um, and what you, this is really clear where, yeah, the, the flatbed scanner has the least error, black background error is uh, a little bit more, and then the illumination box is all over. But, you know, even in the worst case scenario, uh, you're getting, uh, you know, probably less than a uh, 5% error, which is, 
you know, which is acceptable. You know, if you're measuring a 5% of something is totally acceptable uh, for measurement of high throughput. So given that uh, the flatbed scanner and the black background uh, are measuring different things. So the black background will be like, you know, whole intact tubers and the flatbed scanner would be like tuber slices. Let's do an analysis of tuber size along the black background. We'll go back to our, our PowerPoint presentation here and just see where we are. So yeah, this is the information that we uh, we pulled out from from uh, we we just so yeah the uh, black background on the flatbed scanner seem to be the way to go. Uh, next thing we want to know one of the major conclusions from the study is that oops vision measurements. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, I hadn't uh, uh, eliminated one of the things from the old slide, but uh, Next thing we want to know is how reliable are the size measurements? So, like, uh, you know, we Jay Park and his team out at Aberdeen took caliper measurements of these tubers, and we want to compare, like, how accurate are those measurements for uh, how how reliable are these? Do we get the same measurement from computer vision as we do from actually a human taking them? Um, and it looks like they're pretty reliable. We'll go back and we'll uh, we'll assess, you know, what uh, we'll make all these plots again, but. The take home is, is that, you know, you're getting, uh, you know, greater than 90% correlation uh, for like length, width, and even for like area as it relates to weight, which was kind of surprising to me. Um, and, you know, by taking these measurements now, you kind of have a, uh, you can very quantitatively describe all the individuals in your population. Um, so let's go back and we'll take, we'll go back to our, uh, our script and we'll, we'll make some of these plots here. Okay. So here, you know, you're, uh, we're converting our uh, our size measurements into uh, from pixels into millimeters. You know, we're calculating some components of uh, you know the, the average the standard deviation. And here we're you know we're actually going to calculate the uh, so a correlation between like the, the weight and the variance, you know, is, is if you're a larger, do you tend to have more variation? The answer is yeah, you know, um, mean size, standard deviation, you know, tuber max and min, coefficient of variation, calculate broad sense heritability. Then we'll, we'll make some of the, the plots that, uh, you know, we, we presented here in the, the PowerPoint document just so people can generate these plots at home, you know. Yeah. So I, I just, you know, I hope that... Uh, the goal here for me is that you know we can provide this uh, this workflow to you and you can you can do this on your own home. The next thing we want to know is like uh, measurements of shape, right? So you know we've we've measured our uh, uh, ordinal values, and you know probably one of the things that we want to measure is uh, the most the most important characteristic for potatoes is aspect ratio. So like the length width ratio, and one of the things. Uh, that was pointed out to me by Nathan Miller at University of Wisconsin. I think this is a great point to make is that there is an inherent relation. This is the data plotted by him. This is, there's an inherent relationship between length and width. They're correlated, right? And that you can think about this in terms of uh, uh, a couple different principles. So because there's a relationship between these two, uh, the longer you are, the longer the tuber is generally, or there's some, generally the wider the tuber is, but that's not always the case. And that there are some, and that, you know, so there's that relationship there, which is a, uh, there's some relationship there, which is like a linear line. And then there's a size component uh, that goes along. So, you know, how big, how big is the tuber? And then how far off that line are you? And then there's some extreme biological limits where, you know, if you're infinite, you can't be uh, infinitely long and infinitely skinny. So this represents like biological constraints within this population. Um, so, one of the things that Jay did is he took several different types of shape measurements. So like uh, aspect ratio. So basically length with ratio based upon calipers. And he used like an ordinal scoring system. Uh, we're calling this SVA based on uh, SOLCAP uh, 
uh, variety assessment, I think, or value assessment. Basically, it's a, an ordinal scoring value. So, you know, things that are longer will get a value of five, whereas things that are smaller will get a value of two. We want to compare these measurements of shape to uh, measurements that can be collected, you know, using computer vision. So the same, the same quantity here, eccentricity, and then some of the biomass profiles that we uh, introduced earlier on, the latent traits. So are, are all measurements of shape equivalent? Uh, yes and no. Um, so like for length width ratio, you get the same measurements, uh, whether you're taking it with a caliper or whether you're letting the computer do it. Uh, with the, uh, the ordinal scoring, yeah, the relationship's there, but you're really not getting uh, a lot of the fine-grained uh, uh, quantitative details. It's just not descriptive enough to capture the variation in this data set. Um, whereas if you're using eccentricity, uh, you're really, uh, it, it really gets kind of wonky at the tails of the distribution here. You know, and we'll go back to our, our program and make all these plots again uh, and kind of look to see, you know, we'll just go through that and see how that works. So the first thing we did is we just did it for, uh, for our, our marker, you know, so yeah, the, the marker, the, the length with ratio of the marker does not change at all. Uh, you know, it's always around one and it varies very little. Uh, whereas the eccentricity is very close to zero because it's a perfect circle and the variation of that is very zero. So now we'll do it for tubers. So, you know, we'll measure it based on calipers. We'll assess the correlation between those uh, different types of uh, values. So, you know, a very high correlation between uh, uh, the, the ratio is measured by caliper or by human or like even very high between the eccentricity value and the uh, uh, values measured by humans. Um, it doesn't, the correlation isn't as high for the, uh, the S, you know, the, the ordinal scoring, but still very high, or, you know, it still means the same thing. And here we're just making plots of these correlations. So, okay. Okay, so now, now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, analysis of these tuber biomass profiles. As you recall, uh, these as you recall, these are like uh, sweeps along, you know, proportional sweeps. You get a hundred values for how many pixels were in there along the X and the Y axis, along the X and then the Y axis. And one of the things that Nathan Miller has told me is that, Max, it's probably not appropriate to be uh, using these values uh, along the Y axis just because it contains so many zeros. So in the future, it would be beneficial just to use the, the sweeps along the X axis. But uh, this is a work in progress. But you know, and we're, we're, the analysis that I'm gonna present today uses sweeps along both the X and the Y axis. The problem is, is when you put these values into uh, PCA, uh, the, the large number of zeros uh, tends to do wonky things to it. But you know, looking at the data and talking with him, the conclusions that we're arriving at are not incorrect. It's just not maybe the best mathematical way to do it. So, okay. Well, uh, so basically what we're doing is we're taking those values, uh, those sweet values along the X and Y axis, and we are... Uh, putting them into principal component analysis and then pulling out, you know, plotting what the value is of principal component of the principal component. Um, so yeah, we have our, we have our sweeps. So a hundred values uh, along this axis for each tuber, a hundred values along this axis for this tuber, put that into PCA and here's the values that you get out. Um, here, what we have plotted is like the values of each, e each clone. So these are not individual tubers. These are a clone average plotted, like PC1 is plotted along the x-axis and PC2 is plotted along the y-axis. These uh, lines are basically the standard error of each clone. So this would be clone two, this would be clone 10, this would be clone 170. And uh, when you put this data in and then you look at the, uh, the data that it came from, you see like two trends. So along principal component one, things that have a low score of principal component one tend to be very rounded, okay? Like they uh, they tend to look like baseballs, okay? 
whereas the average tends to be kind of in between, you know, it's, it's more uh, elongated and things that have an extreme uh, high value along uh, principal component one tend to be uh, long and narrow. So, I mean, this is, uh, this is length with ratio. That's what we're measuring here, okay? But the interesting thing is along principal component two, if you look at the extreme values, so let's say clone two uh, or clone 170, you find that things uh, that have high values tend to have more pointiness, so less thick at either the stem or the butt end. Um, so to me, what, what that means is that uh, what, you're what, you, what you can, the information you can get here is you know, how pointy are the ends. So the, the value that you'd put in for breeding would be uh, the absolute value away from zero. So we don't really care whether it's at this end or this end, it means the same thing. We want to select against. Uh, we want to select against things that have pointy ends. So we're, we're looking for things that have a uh, a value uh, close to zero, and we're trying to avoid things that are uh, you know highly negative or highly positive. What we have here plotted on this side is just these are the individual data points along the x-axis. So you know uh, at the top of the tuber, uh, this is you know. Each one of these little black points is how you know how thick the tuber is, so you can kind of see a shoulder here. Uh, whereas on this end, the shoulders over on this side. Um, I hope that makes sense. This is not something that's easy for me to describe, but uh, that's what I think we're measuring. So let's let's go back into the uh, the R program, and we'll uh, we'll generate uh, these figures here. Okay. Okay, so we have our, we'll make a scree plot just to see, you know, how variable these uh, these values are. So probably the first, I don't know, uh, five or six PCs contain some information based upon how much variance is explained. Um, we can merge, you know, these values with all the other values. Just a plot uh, of... Uh, what the PCs look like. Um, and we want to do uh, correlation, you know, between, uh, let's see, so we think that it's probably length with ratio. Yeah, it's like, you know, the first PC from these biomass sweeps are, uh, are definitely correlated with length width ratio. Uh, whereas if you uh, look at the value for PC2, It's really not correlated. You know, you have a lot less correlation there. Um, so, yeah, go down and, oops. So here we're going to uh, uh, collect some, you know, some aggregate data about these things. And we'll go down here and we'll generate the plot. Oops. So that, that's the plot we discussed. And then, you know, if we want to make, we want to plot the, the profiles of the individual tubers and their mean. That's what we're doing here. So that's the PC1 profiles, PC2. PC2. And now we can calculate, you know, our H squared, you know, our broad sense heritability. Okay, so uh, let's move on to color. Okay, I, I uh, you know, we can take color measurements. So one of the ways we can evaluate, you know, how well or how reliable these color measurements are is by using data from the color checker. I used uh, some of the, the functions from the plant CV library to extract uh, the values from these color measurements and then plotted them across the entire experiment. And one of the things that you find is that like these are color measurement is highly variable. Okay. Like uh, particularly uh, lighter colors tend to be more variable, uh, whereas darker colors tend to be less variable. So, you know, uh, 
take the, take anything you can take any uh, even though we have consistent lighting and consistent camera settings across the entire experiment, these are really pretty variable. So uh, uh, you know that's disheartening to see. But the question is, is like, can we still use these measurements to learn something about the biology? I um, mean, so we've extracted these histograms, and then we once again we put those straight into PCA, uh, and you know we can figure out you know out of these PCs how much variance does it explain? You know, so you're probably Probably the five first, the first five PCs may have some information, um, and then you know we can plot out a PCA of uh, tuber flesh color. And what you see is along the the first principal component, you're getting uh, uh, a a range from uh, uh, very light values of tuber flesh to very dark values of tuber flesh, um, meaning that you know you could use this information uh, along PC one to map. Uh, for tuber flesh color, because uh, of the, the high broad sense variability. I'm not sure what values or what the meaning is of uh, the color values along principal component two. I didn't see any trends that stood out to me, but it's very clear on principal component one, you're getting like a, a light to dark uh, ratio. Um, once again, uh, this might not be the best way to do this. Uh, Nathan Miller uh, at Wisconsin says, Max, uh, you know, once again, you're dealing with a lot of zeros, and by putting those into PCA, that's probably not uh, the best way to do that. Uh, if you think about what these histograms are telling you, the the defining information would be like the peak of the histogram or the average value along that, and then a measurement of distribution spread. So, probably for publication, we won't be using these histogram values. We'll be using like summary measurements of those. But it's just uh, that that's what we did to this point, and. Uh, you know, uh, this is not wrong. It just might not be the, you know, you're still getting biology out, but it just might not be the uh, best mathematical way to do it. So another take home from this is that, you know, we can calculate heritability of all these things. I, I, I mentioned that all these, uh, generating all these figures that we have here, uh, they are in the, the script that uh, that I provided as part of this, uh, this uh, uh, workshop today. So if you if you go and you, uh, you know, you, you go, you can see uh, how variable the, the color standards are. Um, you know, you can make plots of, uh, of what they look like. Um, you know, you can do an analysis of tuber flesh, tuber skin color. Let's see. Yeah, tuber skin color, but we're, well, I'm not going to go through that in all great detail just because of uh, limitations on time. But if you want to, this is an exercise that you can go through on your own, or you can contact me and we can talk more about it. Um, so let's see. Okay. Yeah, that, well, it, well, let's get back to it. The, the traits are, uh, these traits are, uh, are heritable. You know, you're getting high broad sense heritability for uh, almost all of these traits, meaning that, you know, you can apply genetics to those and map on those and select individuals that have uh, uh, size, shape, or different skin or flesh color characteristics. So now we've covered, uh, you know, how to take gravimetric measurements. We've covered how to get uh, measurements of size, uh, shape, uh, internal and external color. Um, let's think about uh, the last component that we want to talk about today. So like, how susceptible these clones are to defects. You know, so here, like this is an example of one defect you can get called hollow heart. And basically we wanna be able to have the computer automatically tell us how many tubers within this clone have this defect. So, I mean, we need to measure a lot of different types of defects. Potatoes get attacked or uh, look terrible in all different types of ways. So some of them are uh, pathogenic. So things that we work on in my breeding program are like nematode resistance. Uh, or corky ring spot resistance, that's a, a virus caused by tobacco, or that's a that's a, a disease symptom that's caused by tobacco rattle virus, um, or, you know, developmental or physiological uh, uh, problems, so like growth cracks, surface cracks, stuff like that, uh, or greening that can happen, you know, if your tubers uh, stick out the side of the hill. Uh, I mean, you don't want green tubers because they tend to accumulate uh, toxic glycoalkaloids. But we need to be able to measure these, right? Um, we need to be able to measure internal defects. So things like uh, hollow heart, I mean, all different types of uh, tuber defects. Um, some are developmental, some are pathogenic. Um, and what you can do is now that, because you have all this digital image data, you can go back and like uh, 
uh, uh, annotate each of the tubers in the data set with, you know, do they have a defect or not? What defect do they have? And you can start thinking about, you know, how can I classify, uh, you know, how can I begin to classify what tubers contain what defects? So uh, basically what we tried to do is we tried, you know, we can plot out the, the profiles, the RGB profiles of each of these tubers. And you can clearly see this difference between ones that like have hollow hearts, so ones that are darker versus ones that are lighter. Uh, but, you know, if using the PC data, you know, if you have the defect, you can't really do a good job of classifying them. So I think what you're going to need is you're going to need some sort of uh, uh, deep learning or, or computer learning uh, method to be able to classify those. Uh, so that's where, uh, that's where our collaboration with uh, Arash Abbasi comes in. So the take homes from this for me are, uh, you know, we can collect a whole bunch of different measurements of tubers. Uh, using this type of inexpensive platform. Uh, measurements are heritable. You can use them for breeding or selection. Uh, in this experiment, uh, in our experience, the black non-reflective background works best. Uh, and if you had to pick something, uh, you'd want to measure more genotypes. Uh, you, genotypes are more important than replicates, and they're more important than measuring both sides of the tuber. Uh, another, key, another key finding is, is this workstation format, you know, so you're, uh, you know, Having uh, workstations uh, is inexpensive. It's good. It's well suited for like the type of work we do here in Prosser, small plot work on early stage populations, and it's scalable, meaning that like it's not that expensive to build another uh, imaging station. You know, you could probably do that for uh, less than a thousand bucks. You know, um, and you just you just hire more people to do to take the measurements. Um, and finally, you know, what you get out of that is you get a digital catalog that help you sort through uh, all the different clones in that breeding population and possibly pick out the best using uh, marker-assisted selection. And you know, we'll need more more data on disease and defect, uh, particularly for colored potatoes, to help build those classification algorithms. So, with that, I, I just want to acknowledge a lot of the people that contributed to the work. Uh, we're a really small group, and you know, we don't have a lot of money to work with, but. Uh, these type of tools uh, can really help us do some cool science. So with that, I would like to hand it over to uh, uh, Dr. Abbasi to kind of uh, share a little bit about uh, some of the uh, machine learning stuff that he's working on. Uh, Arash, uh, uh, are, are you ready to, uh, are you ready to uh, share the screen maybe? Yes, yes, ah, thank you. So here, Screen sharing is the easiest, okay. So do you see my, uh, do you see that? Yeah. Okay, but I don't see myself, that's okay. So hello everyone, hello again. My name is Arash Abbasi and I'm from Iran and I came to United to the United States in 2010 to study PhD at Oregon State University and after that I was a postdoc at Danforth Plant Science Center and my boss was Noah Falgren and I learned a lot from him and uh, that was the beginning of for me that uh, to work with a plant biologist and it was really good experience and before that I didn't know anything about the plant and I still don't know but uh, better than nothing so yeah my presentation is really short maybe just five to ten minutes and I'm going to cover basic of the AI <clears throat> machine learning and uh, let me okay uh, machine learning for plant <clears throat> biology so in this picture we see a couple of uh, 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 definition for artificial intelligence or AI, machine learning, deep learning, big data, and data science. So you see that all of them have uh, all of them have overlap with each other. And in this particular presentation, we are going to focus only on deep learning. So here we see another uh, diagram for AI algorithm, machine learning, and deep learning, and uh, this definition is more difficult to understand than the real, uh, if we go to next slide, we see more examples. So basically deep learning is something that we work with neural networks. So that is the 
main important things here. So why do we need to use deep learning? Why not traditional machine learning algorithms? So here we see the comparison between different types of algorithms that we have for, for example, for classification. You see that in traditional machine learning algorithm, if we have more data, we cannot get better performance. So the performance doesn't get improved because the amount of data doesn't help the algorithm. But as long as we increase data for deep learning algorithm, we see better performance. Why? Because in deep learning algorithm, the model automatically go and uh, goes and find the uh, suitable information for classification or for segmentation. But in traditional machine learning, some experts should extract information from that data that we have. So here we see another example for traditional machine learning versus deep learning algorithm. So for example, let's Twitter is going to classify tweets between polite or offensive. And if we wanted to use traditional machine learning algorithm, some experts should go and analyze the, for example, find features from the tweets or images that these are offensive or not. So it's really complex model. But in deep learning algorithm, the model we give the input of the tweets, for example, and we uh, uh, want to train the model and say, okay, this is polite or classification. So this is polite, offensive or whatever. So basically in deep learning, we provide the model input and output. And the model is as a black box. And the model deep learning here is going to do everything. We're just going to give the model input and output. That's uh, the reason that the data is really important in deep learning algorithm. So an example of the machine learning algorithm. If you remember, I said that in machine learning, we need feature extraction. And that feature extraction sometimes need ex expertise. So what kind of information we want to, uh, it's good for classification or segmentation. So this is uh, uh, one example that uh, we developed at Danforth Plant Science Center. And the paper is a Plant CV, Plant CV2, that you can find it on the Plant CV website. And we wanted to uh, classify or segment different types of the plant that we have. Uh, plant, chlorosis, postule, if I pronounce it correctly, and background. So we have four classes. So we can call it, we can look at this problem as a segmentation or classification. And the features that we extracted here from the images, which is input, is hue, saturation, and value. So HSV, we extract this, extracted these features from the images, and then we uh, calculated the histogram or probability distribution function for these uh, parameters that we extracted from the uh, images. So, so the input is the top right image and the output is lower right side of the screen. So you see that we were able to segment four classes with machine learning algorithm. So it's not always the case that we have to use deep learning algorithm. Maybe sometimes machine learning, traditional machine learning algorithms are good enough for the work. And another thing is that Sometimes we call machine learning, traditional machine learning, rule-based algorithms. Why? Because we extracted some rules from the, mm, the images that we have, from the input data that we have. For example, here, we extracted the rules. Rules for us was histogram. So if the histogram is less than some value, we call it, for example, plant or chlorosis. And in this particular case, increasing data 
really doesn't help you to improve the performance performance of the model. For example, if you have 100,000 images, maybe, maybe even 100 images is enough because it's machine learning. If we increase the uh, amount of the data, really the performance doesn't really get better. So here is another uh, ap application of uh, machine learning pixel level segmentation. Again, uh, my friend Zheng at Danforth Plant Science Center, and the, it's another paper that uh, uh, they wrote, and it's about, I think they wanted to, they injected some viruses to the model and they were interested to find part of healthy, unhealthy part of the plant. So again, with uh, uh, machine learning algorithms similar to here, we were able to find healthy, unhealthy, and uh, calculate them. So now I'm going to talk about another uh, topic is deep learning. So for example, let's assume that we want to segment and count number of the leaves in a plant. Can we extract some features? Can we ask, a, for example, computer vision scientists that can you extract some features from this plant and let us know what, uh, how many plants we have, how many leaves we have here, or how many mm, segment the plants? It's really difficult, or maybe it's impossible because who is going to find the features here for uh, that? Okay, this is one leaf, this is two leaves, and so on and so forth. So. Here is the example that deep learning can help us. In deep learning, we don't need to extract features. So we bypass feature extraction. We don't need expertise in that field. And that's the beauty of the deep learning um, um, algorithm. So basically, we just provide the images. Here is the input is the plant. And the output is, for example, the top right of the screen. So we give the input, and output is number of the leaves in the plant. And with that, we can train the model and uh, find the features. We don't find the features. The model goes and find the features and uh, segment and quantify number of the leaves in the plant. And here, because we use deep learning, data is important. More data improves the model. And the data should be as much as possible unbiased. So for example, if we have 100 plants with two leaves, we need 100 plants with uh, 10 leaves. So the data for each class should be unbiased. So that's the important things in a deep learning algorithm. So when we talk about deep learning, we need to also talk about the like why we call it uh, deep. So in the right and the left side, we see that like a hundred, uh, 1980, almost uh, 40 years ago. And you see that the hidden layers, everything that we see between the input and output, we call it hidden layers. So we see that in the left side, we only have one hidden layer. But recently on the right side, we have deep learning so deep. So for example, if we have uh, more hidden layers, we can extract more features. The model can extract more features. So that's why we uh, call it deep learning. And why we can use, why can we use deep learning recently? Because we have more data and also we have more, uh, more com uh, computational capabilities. So we can rent, uh, for example, GPUs from cloud, or we have, you know, with the GPUs, we can have access to very high speed supercomputers. So, with my friend Max, uh, asked me to see if we can develop an algorithm for uh, tuber blemish uh, classification. And he was interested in a couple of uh, uh, treats, I think. 
And uh, one of them was hollow heart versus non-hollow heart, that we wanted to develop this one as a proof of concept and see if we can use deep learning algorithm for uh, hollow heart versus non-hollow heart classification. And again, here, we don't need to find extract features from the uh, images. We're just going to give the input images, which are slices of the potatoes, and we want to train the model that, okay, this is hollow heart, this is non-hollow heart. And each deep learning algorithm or each machine learning algorithms in general, there are, th we have three phases in each deep learning algorithms. Training, when we train the model, validation, when we validate the the model and testing is that we, for example, we want to sell it to a company or something. So in the, not the problem, but in, in the a challenge that we had uh, in the data set that we currently have is that we have, the data set that we have is un, is biased. So I noticed that we have 50 hollow heart cases in the data set that we have and more than 1200 non-hollow heart slices. So this is uh, a, a very huge biased data set. And for the huge um, biased data set, if we train the model with as is, uh, we cannot get to a good accuracy. Why? Because for example, imagine that you predict the weather in Portland always that tomorrow is rainy. So without any effort, you always 90% correct. So that's not the case here. We don't want to train the model that always estimate non-hollow heart because in this case, no matter what, always we have 90%, more than 90% accuracy. So we decided to select 50 hollow heart 50 non-hollow heart images from 1200 non-hollow heart images that we have. So we wanted to train the model with 50 hollow heart and 50 non-hollow heart images. So in total, we have 100 the images, but this data is small data set. As I said, we need more data for deep learning algorithm. So if we have more data, better performance is expected. How much data? We don't know. We, we increase data and we see the performance. As long as we get saturated means that, okay, maybe 200 images are enough. So there are a couple of techniques for increasing artificially data that we have. One of them, and we call them augmentation. So we wanted to we want to increase data without having real data we want to artificially increase the data that we have so what one of the things that we did is the data augmentation is really simple one we just rotated one image that we have and another thing that we did also was to add noise gaussian noise to the data i should say if we have real data, it's much better. But here also we can increase data. For example, if we rotate it and uh, if we add noise on it, so we triple the data that we have. So basically the algorithm that we developed is based on the ResNet. It uh, is a, like a deep learning model that is available on any public domain. So we want to find, we want to give the images hollow heart and non hollow heart slices of the uh, uh, potatoes. And the output is binary classification, non hollow heart and hollow heart classification. So here is uh, the performance, pre precision accuracy performance of the model. And you see that uh, as most of the time or always, the validate validation performance is less than training data set because training data set, always the models see that. So we expect that 
validation validation data uh, accuracy is less than training data set. And uh, you see that the model at the beginning, when the model doesn't know anything, so model is just started to learn the features and extract the features. You see that the performance at the beginning, the first iteration is 50%. 50% is the worst case scenario. It's like flipping a coin and just saying 50-50. And after that, we see that we the performance of the model increase increases and the uh, iteration by iteration and we get to almost 92 percent of the uh, accuracy after 1000 iteration or sometimes we call it epochs so with that that was my presentation and i hope you enjoyed That is awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both, guys. It was very great. Um, yeah, I, I feel really impressed what you guys are doing. And that's amazing. Thank you for sharing to uh, the scripts and also examples. And uh, so just for start, uh, I do have some questions here. But if you are watching over there, you can send your questions right now in the comments. And we're going to go talk with the speakers, OK? The first question that I have is, did you guys compare using RGB and hyperspectral images for doing these predictions, or it's based only on RGB for the hollow heart and uh, no hollow heart images? Well, this is all, you know, we're really limited uh, as far as uh, what our, uh, the hardware we have available within our breeding program. So it's almost all RGB images at the moment. Um, one thing that will that would limit uh, your ability to uh, acquire that data is just the speed of acquisition of uh, hyperspectral measurements. Um, I mean, I think that uh, using multispectral sensors would be valuable for these types of classification routines, but uh, we just don't have that capacity at the moment. I think that uh, going to Arash's point of uh, finding ways to uh, more efficiently acquire this data so we can build the models uh, would be useful. So, you know, we need a platform to be able to, uh, to measure this stuff more efficiently. Uh, and also just getting the research subjects, you know, like out of a population of 1900 tubers, only 50 of them had hollow heart. I think that by working together with like potato processors, so people like Simplot, people like Lamb Weston, people like McCain's, we could probably, uh, identify tuber lots that have, uh, you know, a higher proportion of these defects run them through a, uh, a more high throughput, more expensive, more high throughput grading line that uses some of these multispectral sensors, that would really be a way to uh, uh, build better classification models, I think. Yeah, that's great. I remember when I was working with Dr. Andelman in Wisconsin, and we do have a huge variability in between family, among families, uh, hollow heart. So some families has much more than others, and you know, some progenitors that have zero hollow heart at all. Yeah, that's great. Uh, uh, in these, uh, not on, on the machine learning, but on the other applications, what the importance to have the color card? You see the color card, you know, in the lighting box. I uh, recommend to use that. So I think there's, there's two applications of that. One is you can perform color balancing. Um, I followed actually, uh, I made an attempt to color correct the data sets that, uh, that are, are deposited up uh, uh, on the GitHub account and uh, using the, the workflow uh, presented on the Plant CV website, that really didn't work too well. Um, and I'm not sure why. It's probably operator error, but uh, you know, there are some functionality available in MATLAB. So you know, Nathan Miller uh, at Wisconsin was able to run that through and color correct all the images. Uh, so that's a nice feature. Um, other things are if you if you do have uh, a difference in lighting, that will give you a way to detect. You know, uh, is there is there a systematic bias within your imaging platform uh, using that standard? That's awesome. Yeah, great. Uh, so in that case, in the scripts, you guys normally uh, you select one picture, adjust the pipeline, and then run a loop to extract data for all other images, right? 
Yeah. So, I mean, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the workflow that we presented in the Jupyter Notebook, I mean, yeah, we have a, uh, we basically run it in a loop. You know, you, uh, you put, you know, you load the data in and you just do the same thing for every single image. Yeah. Okay. It, it follows the exact same workflow. It's just in a loop. Awesome. We do have one question here. It's from Theo. Hello, both. Thank you. Uh, uh, when you search for a uh, hollow heart, you are taking pictures of a half of uh, the whole tuber. So, Max, are you trying to take pictures with a robot? We'd love to. You know, that, that's one of the things that's on our, uh, that we, we, we really want to be able to do. You know, uh, we, we don't have the capability to, uh, there's no robot out there that slices tubers uh, and then takes, you know, images of them that I know of uh, or that I can order off the shelf. Uh, uh, processors have ways of doing that, you know, using water knives and all kinds of sensors, but we don't have that capability in my breeding program. Um, probably the best way to do that from my, from the way I'm thinking about this, and please, like if there's somebody out there that has a better idea, email me. Uh, probably the best way to do that is just slice open a bunch of tubers, run them on a conveyor belt under an imaging module uh, to collect it that way. Uh, that would increase throughput. Uh, Max. Yeah. Uh, another, another suggestion maybe is that non-invasive, you know, imaging system that even we, if, I don't know if it's possible or not, uh, that we can see through the potatoes in, even without slicing that. That's, that's typically the way they do that in, uh, like industrial grading is a lot of x-rays you know, where you can actually look through that. But, you know, for the case of other blemishes, uh -huh. some of the other blemishes will not be as clear uh, as hollow heart, you know, with those X-ray images, I think. You know, we'd love to work with folks that have access to X-ray CT or other things to see, you know, which of these external or internal blemishes that we can measure non-destructively. Non Got it. Yeah, uh, I was wondering here, uh, which was, the hard part to train models uh, and machine learn for do this kind of predictions is to have pictures or to choose which layers, how many layers, what, how you guys decide these features. Uh, you know, it's you know you you work on it, you know, and uh, you see what what model uh, has a better performance. So. Uh, the one of the problem that we had here was that the data was really small, you know, 50 images with hollow heart and 100, 1200 images with non uh, hollow heart. So that was one of the problem. And then we decided to just select a couple of 50 out of 1200. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that was the biggest challenge here. Okay. I'd, I'd like to add into some other challenges that maybe uh, Arash is uh, uh, being, you know, the one who's analyzing is not quite aware of that, you know, the person that did the annotation of the, uh, the defects inside the tubers is me. And I'm not an expert at doing this. I'm looking at a, a USDA defect card and then flipping through the images and trying to annotate which ones have which defect. Uh, so, you know, particularly for characteristics like bruise or other things, the annotation that I've provided for the machine learning is probably not great. Okay, we do have another question here for uh, Ana Maria Hellman. Uh, Max and Aras, thank you very much for your amazing presentation. How much uh, would it be the approximate cost to integrating this technology on breeding workflows? So, uh, from from the data acquisition side, um, you know. The hardware expenses are really minimal. You know, you're talking about like Raspberry Pi computers or other, you know, PC computers or Linux Linux operating system computers. You're you're buying a camera, an imaging box. Uh, I mean, that's going to be less than a thousand bucks probably. Um, scanner, less than a thousand bucks. The where you're going to for the uh, the platform is described in this presentation. The biggest expense will be labor. Uh, you know, get finding somebody who's going to be able to do the monotonous job of laying out those tubers, following the queue uh, on the uh, uh, the computer, and just keep doing that again and again and again is slow. I mean, you can make more workstations, but it's always going to cost more with the labor. Uh, so having a grading line uh, would probably be better. I don't know, but on your end, Arash, like uh, how expensive is it? If you had a massive data set, you know, where uh -huh. you needed GPUs, 
Is that expensive? The GPU, you know, having the GPU, renting the GPU, if uh, if someone is going to work on that, uh, I think it's like $5 an hour. If, if your institu institution doesn't have the GPU, right? So now I use University of South Dakota GPUs system. I, I work at DSU, Dakota State University, but I use it, U University of South Dakota GPUs and it's really good for me. But if we didn't have that one, we should look for another, uh, you know, another way for having GPUs. You guys know about any open open platform like Cyverse or some system where people can use for training models? I haven't used them. Okay. The, the USDA uh, USDA does have pretty good infrastructure, like uh, the Cynet infrastructure, that I believe is open to other people outside the USDA through USDA collaboration. I haven't used that uh, that much, but that's something that I think Arash and, and sure. I and other collaborators may be working on in the future. Okay. Definitely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Uh, I have only one last question here. Are you thinking to work with Reds? Or do already work with reds, Max? Uh, so we work with all different sorts of potatoes. So uh, reds would fall under, in my opinion, fall under kind of the specialty category. Okay. Uh, if we were going to be working on reds, it would be in collaboration with uh, uh, Laura Shannon, uh, okay. uh, Susie Thompson, or, or Jeff Endelman. Um, you know, we don't really have a lot of great uh, red white germplasm in our program. <laughs> so you know, it would be. Uh, It'd be collaboration with them, you know. Yeah, great. Because evaluating colors on red is really fun. Is I we have a friend Maria Caraza in Wisconsin working directly with this, and it's really fun to work with her because it's really beautiful, right? See the segregation for color. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Uh, any other uh, thing that you guys want to share or talk with us? Open uh, this. We use this moment now to invite people to work with you, and you know. <laughs> And Definitely. open for partnerships. Definitely. If if you have data or something, please let us know. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm really thankful for your time, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, working with all of you in the future uh, uh, to learn more about biology of uh, potato. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really, really amazing. And uh, thank you for sharing everything here. Okay. So bye bye guys. Bye bye. <laughs> yeah, now uh, let's uh, yeah, introduce our next workshop for next Friday. Uh, as you can see here, next Friday we have Duke Pauli from uh, University of Arizona and his group. They have a really big group here. Uh, they're gonna talk about their system for phenotyping and showing how they are analyze, analyzing this data on Arizona. So it's pretty exciting. So thank you to be here today and hope to see you next Friday. Help us sharing this video in your social media and also signing up here. If you have a workshop or a system that you are using your lab, in your you know, institution and you wanna share with our community, please, Send an email, contact us, and see you next Friday. Bye-bye, guys. <laughs>